You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. From Grand Tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee stops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Today we are in Calta Girone. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze piscine, nus picu de cicora, nus picu de cicora. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze piscine, nus picu de cicora, se non mangiano le femmine. Hello and welcome to the Cycling Podcast. My name is Lionel Burney and I'm joined in Sicily by Daniel Freib. You go with the English pronunciation. Daniel Freiber. You're confusing everyone. Daniel Freiber. Where's our usual host, the buff? He has gone home. He went home from Israel. Oh, he had a bruising encounter, didn't he, um, when he was trying to get out of Israel? The exit interview, I gather, was uh, extensive, yeah. Um, oh, he was, uh, his Facebook... Um, profile was was looked into. Uh, he was asked why he'd been to, uh, was it Doha? Go- Google search history. I understand. It was brought <laughs> was brought up. <laughs> I'm surprised they let him go home at all. Um, anyway, Daniel, you've joined us fresh from Yorkshire, having done Wouldn't your say fresh, having done your own alternative hipsters version of the the big start, the Grande Partenza in uh, in Yorkshire. How was Yorkshire? Well, racing wise, I think it would have been great if. The four days in Yorkshire could have been bolted onto the front of the Giro in place of the three days that you actually had. As, uh, that's what I gather anyway. I didn't see an awful lot of the first three stages. So you think you got the, the long straw? Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. Well, oh well. Well, here we are in Sicily. We've had an eventful day, haven't we? Um, we've got oh, we've got a slight concern over our hire car, um, which had a soft tyre, not as uh, catastrophic as some of our colleagues um, Rob Hales and Matt Stevens have suffered a double puncture this evening on what was an extraordinary cross-country drive from the finish in uh, Caltagirone to our hotel where we are now in somewhere not far from Licata not far from tomorrow's start in Agrigento Um, we are a little bit behind schedule because it's been quite a testing evening but you know the listeners don't want to know about all of our they're all testing us they're all testing line and we just have to buffalo through but i'm wondering even in his absence <laughs> i'm wondering whether we should record this in uh you know double speed so we make sure that we get dinner this evening um but let's kick off with the tale of the tapa stage four catania to catel girone um it was the first stage on italian soil in sicily and the break that went contained content Jorogui of ag2r maxim belkov of katusha Marco Frapporti of Androni, who's in the break again, as was Enrico Barbin of Bardiani, the king of the mountains at the moment, and Jacopo Mosca of Villa Tristina. And uh, they were away most of the day. Um, there was a brief moment with around 100 kilometres to go where there was, a, there was a split in the peloton, um, and it, it took a little while for both halves of the peloton to come back together. When we got to the 30 kilometres to go mark, it was just Frapporti, Mosca and Belkov out in front alone and they stayed out there until around 13 and a half to go just inside the last 10 kilometers Valerio Conti attacked for team UAE Um, they'd been setting a strong pace so clearly they wanted to set up Conti you may remember at Peschici last year he was in a great position to try and win on an uphill finish um, uh, but lost it going around the right hand corner tight U-bend and was it Izaguirre won that day one of the Izagire brothers won that day. I'm not, I'm not even going to guess. One of the seven Izagire brothers. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to guess which one. Um, anyway, Conti was out there um, l- l- making a good fist of it. There was another crash or a crash just as the road um, narrowed down with seven kilometres to go. And, and that kind of disrupted the finale a little bit as far as positioning was concerned. So... Um, Conti was still out in front with three and a half kilometres to go and there were splits all over the place. Lotto Fixall played an absolute blinder. Um, they managed to force a couple of splits and it was all, um, you know, fracturing. Uh, Tosh van der Sander was up there. We'll hear from him in a little bit. Setting up Tim Wellens for a an impressive stage win. Um, he won at Roccarasso two years ago on a much harder uphill finish. Um, he won here today for Lotto Fix-All. And the 
news really is that Chris Froome lost 21 seconds. Um, so the start of his duo goes from not so great to really not so great. I won't say bad to worse. Um, quite a few changes in the top 10, most notably uh, Simon Yates is now up to third overall um, because he was just behind Wellens, Michael Woods and Enrico Battaglin, who were the first three over the line. Uh, no change to the other jerseys. Elia Viviani is still in the points competition lead. Barbine is still in the King of the Mountains and Max Schachmann is still the best young rider. But Daniel, what did you make of, what did you make of Tim Wellens' um, victory and the way Lotto fix all pulled that off today? Well, well, the first thing, Lionel, that struck me right from this morning was that a, a finish like today's um, used to be sort of stock in trade uh, for the Giro, particularly in the sort of noughties. Um, there used to be maybe three or four typically finishes like this in the first two weeks. And there was a whole, there would be a whole host of riders who would you would consider to be absolute specialist for this time, type of finish. So you'd have Paolo Bettini, Davide Rebellin, um, Riccardo Ricco, um, Daniel Di Luca. Daniel Di Luca. Um, and, and you would also have a lot of the, the general classification riders, the contenders who, who were that kind of rider, who were climbers who could um, finish quite fast. And time bonuses ended up playing quite a big role in the general classification for that reason. Um, this year's sort of collection of overall contenders um, are notable by their sort of absence of, of finishing speed. Um, and I think that's a reflection on how the Giro has maybe evolved in the last few years. Um, big emphasis on long climbs and very high climbs. And, and I think it's maybe even a, a bigger reflection on the fact that the Vuelta has really kind of sucked in a lot of the very explosive climbers um, who really see that race as a massive opportunity to to win stages. And um, as I say, the, the, with the time bonuses on offer, so it's 10 for a win, um, you, if you look ahead to stages like the Mercoliano di Monte Vergine in a few days, that was a, that's a finish we've been to a few times and guys like Cunego and De Luca won and, and you know, they would pick up bonus seconds there. Um, I almost feel that... It, it's, it's a missed opportunity for for someone. Um, I don't know who that mythical someone would be, but for a, a kind of fast finishing GC guy to be here and just um, taking some easy seconds, really. Yeah, Tim Wellens, obviously, he, he got the 10 seconds. Michael Woods, six seconds. He's been spoken of as a, a potential outsider for the podium. Um, maybe it's a stretch too far to think he could win the Giro, but uh, he's obviously started the race um, well. He, uh, well, I, well, I caught a quick word with him at the finish line so let's just hear what Michael Woods of Team EF Education first said. Yeah I managed to catch back up and felt great today just uh, guys were really good for me everyone was helping me a ton on the team Tom Van Asbrook was amazing but Wellens was, Wellens was just a better man I mean yeah yeah it was great but I wanted to win Michael how uh, how do you feel you know a number of weeks on after Liege Baston Liege you know the first chance to really test the form these last few days Yeah um you spend so much time just sitting in your bed thinking, oh, will it be good enough? Spend even all this race thinking, oh, am I going to have it for the climb? But uh, now I'm doing, I'm racing enough these days now that I have a better understanding of where I'm going to be at. And uh, yeah, I felt great throughout the day, so I knew I was going to have a good one today. And what about the early start yesterday and the flight and not having a regular rest day? Was that a concern at all? No. Everyone's going through the same thing. I think it was a really cool thing that we did yesterday and the day before. I mean, even I just enjoyed where I was at. Like, it was pretty cool to be in the car, uh, the bus, sorry, driving along the border where you looked over one side was Egypt, one side was Israel. You could see Jordan as well. I wouldn't have had that experience if I wasn't here. And in terms of the next two days on Sicily, what are you expecting? Is tomorrow a little bit similar to today? We, we came here to win a stage and two seconds doesn't cut it yet. We want to win. So Woods, unequivocal there. They were going for the win, trying to get off the mark. Um, came very close, but didn't quite have uh, enough to come round Tim Wellens at the finish. Um, Lotto Fixall played a blinder, really, didn't they? Because they took that uh, tricky approach by the scruff of the neck. You were talking about that generation of riders who would eat up those short hilltop 
summit finish, not really a summit finish, but short hilltop finishes um, a decade or so ago. It was trickier than that, though, wasn't it? With the, the first climb up and then the, the drop down and the unpredictable roads. And, well, we've seen to... Uh, well, firsthand, just how bad some of the Sicilian roads are. The surfaces on the race route, and certainly in the last 10, 20k... They were apparently being repaired, weren't they, an hour ahead of the race caravan? So uh, so we're led to believe. Uh, Jared Gruber, uh, very well-respected and excellent photographer, tweeted something this morning saying that they were filling holes with hot tarmac um, just sort of an hour or so before the race was due. I mean, that seems to me to be quite a, a Sicilian thing, that leaving it to the last minute um, to, to do that kind of patch-up work. Um, but Lotto played a, played an absolute blinder, and, and uh, I spoke at the finish also to Tost van der Sander, who was instrumental in helping Tim Wellens. Um, they, they were up there with numbers, but they played it very smartly as well. How tricky was the run-in and the approach and the little descent, and how key was that in uh, setting up the win? Yeah, it's, I, did, I also didn't know the corners very well, so it was a little bit guessing, and... Uh, but uh, I think if you take the lead, you choose your own lines, and uh, that's what we did, and I think that's really a, a big advantage. And uh, obviously Tim's in great form, but you, you as a team managed to get him into the position that he needed to be in. You took responsibility when you needed to. Yeah, we, we were very committed as a team, and I think that's the most important. We had one goal, and nobody wanted to... Do. Everybody was focused on Tim, and uh, I think that's the most important thing to win as a team. What's it like in your team with Quick Step winning everything every week? Is the pressure on a little bit? Does that come across at all? No, I don't think so. I think uh, we're a different team. We're really, we're really Belgium, and Quick Step is. They have such good riders, and uh, we really we have not so many uh, like leaders, and so. But we do good. I think uh, our season was already very good, and if you see what we won, we can uh, only be happy. And lastly, Tim's obviously in good form, so I mean, maybe another victory on Etna. That's the kind of climb that could also suit him, or do you think maybe too hard? Do you do? Not? I think uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's focused on that. Uh, maybe already tomorrow. It's uh, so it's also a nice finish for him. And uh, on Etna, I don't. Uh, we will see. It also depends how the wind is on the climb. And uh, but uh, we can race now really relaxed because we have stage win. You think it possibly on it and a one for the GC guys more? I think so, yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I was a little bit surprised there. Van der Sander kind of playing down Wellen's chances on Etna. Uh, perhaps tomorrow's stage might suit him better, according to his teammate. Um, because Wellen's won at Rocarasso two years ago, a very impressive attack from a long way out. He said in the press conference that he felt this win had that little bit of extra special to it because he beat the whole lot, you know, from close in, um, rather than sort of making an attack with, I think, 11 or 12 kilometres to go. But um, the Etna climb, I don't know is whether that would be out of the question for Wellens. I mean, it'd I be interesting it, I think to it'll see. be out of the question for Wellens, Lionel. You do? That's what I think. No, no, I do think um, it's harder. I think it's harder than... Uh, the way the race went up last year and last year was an unusual day and an unusual stage in that there was a headwind and it was very defensive. Um, I think it's too steep. Um, Valens is also not renowned for his finishing ability. I mean, today was a bit of a breakthrough in that respect because he, he just waited and did the simple, um, most sensible thing, which was to kind of look around and realise that he was faster and more explosive than a lot of the other guys who were going to get up that climb. Um, usually he doesn't do that. Usually he tries to sort of, you know, pirouette and flounce around and sort of Cruyff turn his way into, you know, up, up blind alleys, doesn't he, he, with about 15 kilometres to go. Are you saying he's a sort of the Belgian equivalent of a whimsical flaneur? He is. He is quite whimsical, isn't he? And the way he rides, certainly... Um, but well, he certainly said, you know, the, the GC is out of the question for him uh, in a Grand Tour. He, he says he's quite happy. He knows the type of rider he is. Um, that's for the week-long stage races and, and perhaps for the classics as well. But uh, you're right. He, he did certainly, he, he pulled it off, but he, he got himself into that position, as did a number of other riders who were up there. I mean, Simon Yates, you know, just looking really good in his opening few days. A very impressive and slightly surprising time trial result. But uh, up there and the thing that struck me about him and also Chavez who was up there looking sprightly as well um, they punched such a small hole in the wind I mean Yates was really racing I mean he's low on the drops he's keeping his head down literally um, 
and uh, you know that he looks to me like he's he's really racing hard for every second and he missed out on a time bonus there but of course they pinched four seconds over uh, the next group including De Moulin and Rowan Dennis and Pino was 10 seconds back and then Aru Betancourt um, and then you have to look a little bit further down 30th place for Chris Froome 21 seconds down and we'll talk about the start of his duo in part two A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast. Thanks to their support, we are here at the Giro d'Italia and the other two Grand Tours this season. Uh, if you want to sample a bit of Italy on your bike, uh, maybe you should check out rafa.cc forward slash travel. Uh, Rafa's love for Italy is written through their DNA. They've even referenced the pink of the Malia Rosa in their brand colours. But the storied history of Italian cycling is just one ingredient in making the country an ideal destination for a bike riding holiday. The food, the wine, the sun-kissed terrain and unmistakable culture makes Italy the perfect place to be a cyclist. And they have trips all over the place, including the Dolomites. And I checked definitely in the Dolomites. Uh, they run from sort of roughly June to October. Check out rafa.cc forward slash travel if that sounds like your bag. Um, Daniel... Chris Froome has not had the best start to this Giro. Um, he's got the salbutamol cloud, if I can put it like that, hanging over him, following him around. Today, uh, caught out in the wrong position, lost 21 seconds. Um, not the way that Grand Tour uh, victories are built, is it, these opening few days? No, it's not. And in our little teaser that we put online earlier, I suggested that I was going to explain, I was going to lift the lid on the the discussion, the animated discussion that took place between, between King Kelly and Elisande and Chris Froome. There was a huge scrum of riders um, after the finish today. It was very, um, dare I say, badly organised. Um, well, it was difficult for the riders to get back down the past the finish line again and they were all kind of hemmed in. And anyway, Froome, um, he, he didn't speak to the media immediately. I think he did at the team bus, but um, he did speak to his teammate. King Kenny Ellison, the, the pint size, the matchbox French climber. Were you close enough to hear what was said? I or wasn't, were you just and I don't think, and, and I suggested in our teaser earlier that it was something scurrilous, and um, Chris Froome was very angry. I'm not sure that was the case. In fact, I'm sure it wasn't the case. Um, Chris Froome, was, I think, was trying to explain to Kenny Ellison what had gone wrong in terms of his positioning, um, because obviously it wasn't quite right and um, but we will endeavour to find out from Ke I, I will search out King Kenny tomorrow and I will ask him um, what exactly went wrong today but for him no he hasn't started well I, I mean I spoke to a couple of people at Sky this morning they're pretty well at least publicly as you would expect they're trying to stay calm and, and they're making all the right noises they say that Froome's not being affected by the injuries from from his crash in the wreck in Israel, um, but you know you mentioned Simon Yates, uh, Lionel, and we we always say that well prologues or short time trials at the start of a Grand Tour or Grand Tour are always significant. Um, if someone loses as little time relative to what you expect as Simon Yates did the other day, then it means they're going really really well. And also the first few stages, you, you know, whether they be sprint finishes or particularly stages like today, uphill finishes, if a guy is close to the front, then it's it's a, generally a pretty good sign that they're going well um, and they're, they're sprightly and they're, um, they're lucid. And, you know, yeah, you look... I, th I think that's, that's a very good point because, you know, 10 seconds lost, 15 seconds lost, you know, it's, it's, it's small in the grand scheme of things, but it, it's what it tells us about how um, a rider is doing. You know, it's... <laughs> Riders who are going well don't get caught in bad positions often. You know, that, that's part of bike racing, isn't it? It's, it's a, when somebody is really on song, they have the legs to get out of trouble, anticipate difficulty before it happens. They have teammates who, you know, if they're all on song as well. And I think that's what we've seen a number of years in, in the Tour de France with Chris Froome is that 
They don't make mistakes. And no, you, and that's you, a trait that's kind of been amplified as the years have gone by. He's got better and better at, at negotiating this sort of first week, first 10 days of a Grand Tour. So not off to the greatest start for him, but we might see the legs open up a bit on Etna on Thursday. Who knows? I mean, that's going to be the first big test. But these Sicilian roads, I mean, we talked about it, you know, our own our own challenges with them in our in our hire car. Um, the, some of the holes in the, the road that we had to drive along were were horrendous and uh, well in tomorrow's episode of kilometer zero you'll hear max shiandri's verdict uh, on on the sicilian roads uh, potholes that can swallow up swallow up riders and uh, it, it's making these days challenging isn't it the, the stress will start to sort of build up it will be the same again tomorrow it'll be the same again on the run towards etna um and, it, and you know it's it's kind of three tricky days in uh, harder than expected days i think in israel certainly the third stage the one down to elat was uh you know the, the toll it took on the riders because it was long and there was a lot of up and down you know was, was more than perhaps the road book would have suggested and these stages are, are tricky as well and so when you see the riders that, that sort of make the cut and, and those that don't i mean you know, you would have thought that uh, you would have thought that Froome would have would have been able to stay up there and, and not lose further time to to De Moulin and Co. Yeah, I think they'll all be pretty relieved to get off Sicily in the same way that they were. A lot of the riders were relieved to get out of um, Israel, not because you know they thought it was terrible there, but just um, the travel involved and and those. Uh, first couple of sprint stages I gather were pretty stressful and then they a few of them had a, a pretty punishing travel schedule didn't they um, well they did I mean uh, yeah we we made that journey I was on uh, one of the RCS flights I was actually on the last flight to leave Elat um, it was quite an extraordinary morning really because uh, we'd been told certainly by the RCS organisers of the Giro that you know, we're leaving from a modern airport uh, that's not been open to the public yet and when we got up to Ovda um, around about an hour's drive out of Elat into what was basically desert you know the, the dust and sand was hanging in the air making visibility pretty tricky um, it looked more to me like a disused military airfield than a than a, an airport that was ever going to see commercial flight. Um, uh, the flight I was on was the last of four to leave, and it had on it BMC, Sky, uh, Bahrain, Team UAE. Uh, I think Mitchell and Scott were on it as well. So, um, and and we were up at quarter to six to get that flight. We landed at uh, just before one p.m. Um, Sicilian time. You know, it was, it was a three hours ten minute flight. Not terrible, but you know, quite tiring. I was pretty pretty um, tired and I've not ridden three stages of the Giro um, and the riders that were on the first second and third flights you know, they were getting up at sort of four four thirty in the morning um, to make those flights so uh, we know that a lot of well all of the riders then would have done a short ride in the afternoon just to kind of uh, shake out the legs but um, as we heard from Mike Woods you know it's the same for everybody um, and yet it's slightly out of the ordinary to have that amount of travel and then come into three um, not straightforward days. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Independent research shows 10% of sports nutrition products that get a professional rider banned. Trust Science in Sport, the world's highest standard of banned substance testing. Thank you to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. If you would like 25% off all of their products, go to scienceinsport.com and fill up your basket. And then when you check out, enter the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 for a 25% discount on all of their energy bars, gels, powders that you mix up to make into drinks and so on. Um, Sticking with nutrition, Daniel. Oh, yes. Well, you arrived I've got in something Sicily. To say. I've got something to say. <laughs> Go on. I, I was monitoring this morning the correlation between what I'm going to call the canola quotient. So I saw two influential members of teams of, of general classification contenders stuffing their face with cannoli at the start in Catania this morning. So cannoli, um, the thing is, I don't really know much about cannoli etiquette. That's a, that, that's what, that's a, a real gap in my me. knowledge. Um, cannoli are a dessert, a Sicilian dessert. Um, they're kind of like brandy snaps, but without the brandy, um, and filled with sweet ricotta. And they're very, very popular in um, Sicily. I think it's, n it's not unheard of to have them for breakfast. 
um, and to have them with a coffee. Anyway, oh, anyway, names. the two, who the two, Giuseppe Martinelli, who has won more Giri d'Italia than I think any other director sportif. He's the Astana DS here, so he's in charge of Superman Lopez, and he. Was, I saw him splatting himself <laughs> in the face with an enormous canolo um, in Catania this morning. And J- Julian Pino, the brother of Thibaut Pino, um, he he was well effusive about um, where well, he was trying to get us to following him, follow him into one um, vendor of canoli, one shop near the start that he claimed um, after extensive research. Um, over the last 24 hours did the best cannoli in Catania Um, and then he walked out of that one and then went into another vendor of went into another shop selling well by looking at the by looking at the uh, results on the stage Thibaut Pino was 13th at four seconds the last of um, that little group um, and uh, Miguel Angel Lopez Moreno Superman was in the Chris Froome group so I think the the cannoli quotient is absolute nonsense already I'm, I'm, I'm writing it off as insignificant but last night I did have uh, rigatoni norma which is uh, another Sicilian specialty actually uh, specific to Catania where we were last night um, and uh, it was okay it was it, this it, was, uh, it wasn't the best restaurant no, D'Antonio in Catania. It was it was a solid six out of ten. Yeah, but it wasn't. But Catania, I mean, it looks it looks like no one no one has spent any money on that town for about forty place. years. It's a it, similar you know, to Watford. No, that's very harsh. That's very harsh. The people of Watford will be bombarding you on Twitter. I urge them to um, with with abuse for that. Um, no, Cat- uh, Catania in common with a couple of the places we've seen today. I mean, Sicily, look, you know, it's as tough as old boots in places, isn't it? I mean, even we're in an extremely nice hotel on top of the hill here. I'm looking forward to seeing it in the daylight. But as we were driving into town, piles of rubbish just uncollected, just dumped on the side of the road. I mean, not you know, not sort of waist height, but head height piles of rubbish. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, uh, you're going to be talking about Sicily more in the coming days, Lionel, because you're going to be learning some Italian and you're going to be talking about Sicily in Italian. I'm looking forward to this. But just to update on my rigatoni norma, this is a dish of aubergine, tomatoes and a kind of a quite a salty ricotta cheese that goes on the top. It was, I would say it was a six out of ten. I actually think the the one I make at home is better, although I can't get that. Uh, that you really showed me a picture ric- and I didn't approve of what you've done with your sauce well this is another thing where it's like the 11 o'clock cappuccino rule um, Daniel so th- etiquette is you you have your pan of sauce and then you tip your pasta into Basically, the pan of sauce yes. and stir the two together never just serve you the sauce just willy nilly just chucked on a, a bowl of pasta well Willy nilly is a phrase that appears in our Kilometre Zero, uh, which is out tomorrow morning. Uh, it's on the subject of Il Garibaldi, the, the road book, uh, which everybody from the riders to um, the media follow. Um, as Max Chiandri says, it's the Bible of, of the Giro. And uh, somebody, uh, somebody uses the phrase willy nilly. What's, what is it in Italian? Oh, um, um, well, you did the translation, um, Daniel. I mean. Um... <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll come back to that tomorrow. We'll move on. We'll move on. Uh, speaking of Max Chiandri, uh, Rowan Dennis defended the pink jersey again today. Um, we talked about this on the opening weekend in Israel, how BMC Racing's big goal for the Jura was to come here, win the opening time trial, take the pink jersey and carry it back to um, to Italy. That looked like it wasn't going to happen because Tom de Moulin won the opening time trial. But then BMC Racing uh, uh, launched... A modern day coup, really. I can't remember an, an intermediate sprint being quite so significant in recent years. I do remember um, a long time back when sort of Johan Museo and Sean Yates were battling for the yellow jersey at the Tour de France. I think that would have been 1994, and there was all sorts of shenanigans at intermediate sprints. But BMC Racing uh, pulled off something of a tactical coup. Um, Max Chiandri told me all about it as we were bloody marvelous coup. That's what it was. A bloody. Marvellous coup. It was. Well, he told me about it as it? we were... Do you get it? I do get it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he told me about it as we were boarding the plane um, yesterday. Uh, he was... Um 
playing down his role, uh, the significance of his role in persuading um, Rowan Dennis, Nicholas Roach and the other big characters in the team to, to go for it. Um, but I spoke to him this morning about how they managed to prize the pink jersey from the shoulders of Tom de Moulin a couple of days ago. So Friday night in Jerusalem, you were very disappointed. Saturday night in Tel Aviv, you had the pink jersey. Tell me how it happened. You know, they, they did it. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't me on the bike, but... I think a bit of motivation that day came from uh, came from me, and I feel like a little bit of that jersey was mine. Uh, you know, you, you, it took a while. We swallowed we swallowed the, the loss, but then in uh, in the, in the evening, I was like, we have to try tomorrow. We have that three second bonus. We can't just we can't just let it go like that. You know, it's like uh, so it was so disappointed to see somebody sprint when somebody like doesn't really care and gets that three second. That three second changes our life in a way. So, in the morning meeting, I, I, I did an overview of what, what we, I'm going to expect from the Giro, what I want from the guys. And then I went into the detail of the stage. And, and, and you know, first of all, Ron was a little bit, here the word sprint, he was a little bit reluctant. Like, you know, it's not something he was quite familiar with. But he's a guy what can sprint. And he's a guy what can, he actually won a stage uh, last year in Tour des Alpes in, in, in a 60, 60 man sprint uphill, slightly uphill. This is a little bit different, so <clears throat> we started off, we kind of closed a, a few gaps on uh, Campenards, we closed a few gaps here and there, and that's it. then we kind of wasn't quite on it yet. So the race had to kind of evolve a little bit, a little bit more, then it came, you know, a couple of guys came to the car, I explained again what I wanted, and, was, and, I, and then just 30k to go to the sprint, the sprint was around 110. It clicked, and uh, when the click went, uh, we just we just nailed it. We, we went in the front, we closed the gap to the to the three man breakaway, and then uh, I had Jurgen and Ron just said uh, only thing came through the race to the radio. He said I want Ron, I'm mean, sorry, I want uh, Jurgen to to lead him out, and, and and the rest they did it. When you first said, look, we've got to try this, what was the? Were you monitoring the faces of the riders yeah, to see what the reaction was? Yeah, you look at the guys, and, and you know you you. Even if I'm in the car, you're, you're part of that team, you know, so you, you are on the bike with them. And, and initially, it didn't really, you know, I think everybody is still kind of a little bit on, even if Ron gave it 110% on the, on the, on the TT, it, we're kind of still on the, on the loss side, you know. Uh, they didn't see that opportunity. And Ron, the first thing, when, when I saw him in, with a jersey, said, thanks for making me believe in it, you know, so... I think he is really appreciative. That Were a couple of the riders a bit sceptical, maybe? Yeah, you know, obviously it's the first day in the, in the Grand Tour. You've got a lot of kilometres to do. And to start riding for, for nearly 6 to 70k, I mean, everybody's on the conservative side. You know how riders are. That's how they are. But I said, guys, just imagine. I mean, it's first of all, it's an hour of work. It's not a massive amount of work. It's an hour of work. And if you get it, then you'll have a different feeling with the jersey. So you, you'll... I've been in a team where I won a, a Grand Tour, you know, and I'm, it's like you, you, you're flying on a different level. So, you know, they, they slowly bit in, bit into it, and, and, and they did it. And is it Andy Reese's funeral today? It was yesterday, yeah. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's something we talked about, and I talked about to a couple of journalists uh, three weeks ago to bring the jersey in Italy. First day would be amazing. Uh, thank you for everything he's done for us and uh, how he likes cycling and... And it's a small thing for us, what we can give to him, but it means a lot. The question here now, Daniel, is Rowan Dennis in pink, survived today really comfortably, never looked like he was going to be out of position. His team was, were keeping him um, right up at the front when it mattered. Um, he was alert when he needed to be and took responsibility when he had to, to, to make sure that he didn't get caught on the wrong side of splits and, and, and was, was in that group closing up to uh, the Wellens, Simon Yates group uh, as they were going to the line. Tomorrow could be a similar-ish stage. It's shorter, might be a little bit punchier maybe, but the, the big one looming on the horizon, as indeed it does really, you can see it from miles around, can't you? Uh, Mount Etna, the, uh, well, it's a live volcano still, isn't it? Um, are we expecting some kind of eruption there or do we see Rowan Dennis carrying the pink jersey to mainland Italy? I think Rowan Dennis will probably, unfortunately for him, lose the pink jersey. Um, there are too many riders who are close to him on general classification, too many good climbers. Um, Rowan Dennis is yet to really prove his creden credentials as a, a bona fide GC contender in major tours. Um, 
as I say, I, I hope that changes for him. But um, the, there's going to be too much pressure from guys like Superman Lopez, who are already in a position where they have to make up time. Um, there's, a, there's quite a powerful holy trinity there already, isn't there? Lopez, Chris Froome, Fabio Aru all need to kind of make up time. OK, it's only a fistfuls of seconds at the moment. It's not, it's not the, you know, it hasn't stretched out so far to be, um, you know, panic stations just yet. But in order to kind of recover this first section of the Giro, do, can you anticipate any of those three doing anything or does it well, I think like last year does it really depend on the wind direction I think it definitely depends on the wind direction um, as I said it's a slightly different angle of attack this year and um, I think last year was a prevailing wind so um, even if it's a prevailing wind again the, the wind for the riders will be slightly different um, quite a number of the riders know this climb well um, Thibaut Pino spent a long time in Sicily in the spring with his brother the aforementioned Julian guzzler of cannoli um and yeah they had a long training camp so did multiple ascents of, of etna as did fabio Adel, um in in the spring he was a uh, altitude staying on etna as well and so I, th- and I think those are two riders who know they need to make up time um you know, they have lost ground and a lot of the climbers have, well, they had a, a, a really poor first time trial. That said, we're, we're already a quarter of the way into the, the total of the time trial that there is in this Giro. Um, you know, nine kilometres out of essentially about 40. So um, they they will be slightly concerned, I think, and they will want to sort of push on and, and use this summit finish, not least because... Some of the summit finishes coming up are, are quite benign. Um, Mercoliani Montevergine is, is one where Rowan Dennis would keep the pink jersey. And even Gran Sasso d'Italia, the one that comes after that, is hard in the last couple of kilometres, but it's pretty steady before that. So Etna is really the hardest mountaintop finish until we get up north to the, the Alps and the Dolomites. Yeah, so they're the two mountain stages uh, next weekend, aren't they? Um, uh, mountain stage, medium mountain stages, really. So Etna is the first big sh- uh, battleground. And of course, I guess everyone in the race is, is realising that last year, if they were expecting to shake off Tom de Moulin eventually, well, they can't make that same mistake two years running. I mean, they know he, if they don't shake him at all on Etna, they know he's going to be and good for the next two big summit finishes and then you're almost into the third week I mean that will surely be playing on people's minds well, well. yeah and he- Hedwig notwithstanding I think we said at the time even last year on Etna that it was a missed opportunity and the, and the climbers might come to rue that missed opportunity and, and I think they did ultimately well that's still a couple of days away uh, we will uh, well we've had a quite an extraordinary day really I mean we, our problems really we don't want to we don't want to burden the listeners with, with that but it's been a challenging old day hasn't challenging, it? Worry, challenging worrying about the worrying about a tough soft old place tire. Sicily as you said Lionel tough old place tomorrow we're going to Santa Ninfa um, scene of, an, of one of the worst earthquakes in Italian history in 1968 so it's the 50th anniversary of that um so that, that we're crossing some fairly interesting, rugged terrain. We're going into sort of mafia heartland, not too far from Corleone, famous of Godfather infamy. God, I mean, you're 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 making me anxious already. I mean, uh, I've only been here a few hours. <laughs> Wait till we get to Calabria. Well, let's see what tomorrow's stage has in store. Um, as I mentioned, Kilometre Zero, uh, Il Garibaldi talking about the, the Giro d'Italia's Bible. That will be out in the morning. Um, if you've not yet listened to the Friends of the Podcast uh, episodes of Kilometre Zero, the first one was uh, a, a range of views on our weekend in Israel and the Giro's decision to start the race in Israel. Um, Kilometre Zero is available for Friends of the Podcast. Sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com forward slash friends. It's £15 and for that you get all of the episodes of Kilometre Zero, but you also get uh, a whole host of other feature length episodes the most recent of which was the search for the pink panther and the story of the 1978 giro d'italia belgium's last grand tour uh, win by johan de moink no chance that tim wellens is going to do that anytime soon but it was certainly an impressive stage win for him today so we will be back tomorrow hopefully um a little less flustered um we will have to uh, well it's 
coming up to 10 o'clock and we haven't had any dinner yet. Mm. And I, I hope it's We're not just cannoli. Yeah, I'm looking nervously at the at the restaurant staff, <laughs> hoping that they're going to take pity on us. Well, let's get on with it then. Thank you, Daniel. What I not A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Ci giuro che la tenevo giardina che la raccolgo con l'acqua e lo vedo. Ci giuro che la tenevo giardina che la raccolgo con l'acqua e lo vedo.